You see, God entered into that situation and changed her heart with never a word having been spoken simply because he found people who were willing to identify with her and bless her instead of judge her and condemn her. And that their own repentance became an avenue for them to extend forgiveness to her. Now, I can't explain altogether how this works. It's a spiritual phenomenon, but I have seen it work. I remember when I came back from Germany that very time, there was a particular family in our congregation that was having uh, real marital problems. And I had thought for some time I must speak with the wife and talk with her about the situation. I had already spoken with the husband. The husband had come to me. He had some deep concerns about the spiritual welfare of his wife. And I shared with him this idea of empathetic repentance. I said, supposing you and I for 10 days put ourselves under the gun for God and say, God, judge in us the very thing that we see in your wife. Anything in our own life, in that very area that's out of order, Lord, you bring it under conviction. Deal with it. Let it be forgiven and cleansed. And after 10 days, I drove up there uh, to see the uh, wife one afternoon. I didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know what I was going to say. But I went up there, and for two hours, we were able to share in the deepest possible way the things of God and the things that God wanted to do in that family. And she's a, a housewife with some small children. And when two hours had passed, she says, I don't know what's happened to that youngest one of mine. It's like he was drugged. Uh, he's never slept this long on a nap. He'd be up and, uh, well, you know what it's like to carry on a conversation if uh, children are demanding attention and need attention. But it was as though God carved out two hours of time where his word could have primary emphasis in that situation. Now, that's the first thing I thought to share, is just the possibility, you see, in our family situation, in our in our spiritual family, in the congregations, in our communities even, that we can see certain things, and God does not expect us to wink at them and pretend that they really aren't so bad. See, a lot of people say, well, I'm not supposed to judge, and therefore I'll just be accepting of everything. So you accept sin and corruption and everything else and never have any kind of moral discrimination. No. God doesn't expect us to lay aside our moral discrimination, but he says, I don't want you to be the judge. There's a better thing that you can do, that you can enter into the whole dynamic process of forgiveness. You can be an agent of mine for forgiveness. And that's the second step that I want to share with you a little, is the possibility that God opens up to us, you see, to actually convey forgiveness to other people. Did you ever realize that Jesus never had a person come up and ask him for forgiveness? That shocked me when I first discovered it in the scripture. So far as I know in the scripture, there was never a case of a person coming up and saying, Lord, forgive my sin. And yet Jesus forgave sin. How did he do it? He did it unilaterally. You know what a unilateral agreement is? It's one that stems from one side only. Man came up, the paralytic. He said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. The man hadn't asked for forgiveness. He hadn't come for forgiveness. He'd come for healing. But Jesus unilaterally declared forgiveness to him. A woman came and washed his feet. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. She didn't ask for it. The scripture records no, no word of her asking for forgiveness. And the most dramatic of all, as he hung upon the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, those Roman soldiers didn't have any more sense of a need for forgiveness than the man in the moon. They didn't think they needed to be forgiven, but Jesus knew it. And he declared it unto them unilaterally. And he came to his disciples after the resurrection, and he said, Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. He committed to his church the authority to declare forgiveness. Not simply waiting when people come and repent, but to declare it unilaterally the way he did. Now, when I first began to get this uh, thought, it seemed to me almost shocking 
the awesome authority and power that Jesus had commissioned his church to exercise. And yet, I've seen it change lives. In 1968, I was in Leipzig meeting with a group of Lutheran pastors. And one of the pastors there told how he had suddenly been rousted out of his home in the middle of the night by the communist authorities, taken to prison and incarcerated and held there for 13 months and treated brutally. One guard in particular was out apparently to just do everything he could to make the man's life miserable. Physical beatings and interrogations at all hours of the night and all of that. This man prayed and said, Lord, what shall I do, especially about this man? And the Lord said, bless him, forgive him, forgive him. Lord, he doesn't have any more repentance than a mustard seed. Forgive him. All right. He knew the Lord was speaking to him. And so he silently, never said a word to the man, silently in the spirit began to forgive that man. He'd hear the steps come down the, night, uh, the walk, you know, the man's heavy tread toward his cell. And he'd begin to bless him, forgive him. Lord, forgive him for his blasphemy, forgive him for his cruelty, forgive him for all of that, Lord. This went on for three days. They were coming back from an interrogation and the pastor said to this guard, you know, I was taken out of my home in the middle of the night with no warning, and my mother, who was quite ill, was with us at the time. She may even have died in the interim. Would it be possible to just put in a telephone call and find out how my mother is? And this hard and cruel guard said, Malzahn, we'll see. He came back and he said, I'm going to be alone tonight. I will go up to the office and put in a telephone call. Now, mind you, you can't say a word, but I'll put the question for you. So they went up to the office, put in a telephone call. He said, now, remember, you can't say a word. The moment the phone was lifted on the other side, he took it from his own ear and shoved it over to the pastor. And the pastor startled. He said, hello. And the voice on the other said, Papa, is that you? It's this little daughter. Where's Mama? Oh, she's not home now. And uh, so the father spoke just briefly with the daughter and hung up. And the man said, well, we'll wait and call later when your wife is home. So they sat there and talked. And he said, in that about hour they were sitting there in the office, he said, that man was completely open. I talked to him about Jesus. I communicated to him anything I wanted to. No objection. Whether that ever found root, he said, I've never found out, but he heard the gospel. Then they called again. Five times they called. Finally, the wife came home, and all the time the guard was saying, now remember, when she answers, you can't say anything. I'll ask the questions. The moment the wife answered on the other side, the fifth time they'd called, shoved the phone over to the man, and he talked with his wife and found out that his mother was all right at that time. Then... He went down and the guard said, uh, uh, how's the food? Well, the pastor said, uh, honestly, it's not very good. The guy said, we'll see. Came back a little later with his own dinner and gave it to the pastor. He said, uh, would you like to have a bath? Well, he'd been there a couple of weeks now and was feeling pretty crummy, hadn't had any chance to wash. He says, tomorrow I'm going to be alone again. He said, I'll take you into the washroom and I'll lock the door from the outside so nobody will see you. All the hot water you want, you can have a shower. This is the power that was released, you see, to break the shell of that man. Because this one man was willing, you see, instead of judging and condemning, to forgive. Whosoever sin you forgive, they are forgiven. You see, sin is not only a problem of guilt. God comes and deals with an individual at the question of guilt, but sin is also a power that binds. And we have always taken the approach to see that if you repent now, you ask for forgiveness, then we'll give it to you. It's like a dog jumping for a wiener. You know, here's the wiener now. You jump high enough for, and, and ask for forgiveness, and then you get the wiener. That's the forgiveness, see. Not realizing some people are so bound up they can't jump two inches. They're so bound by the power of sin that until someone in the 
priestly power of God comes and declares unto them forgiveness. Not going up and telling them. This is in the Spirit. Say, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare forgiveness to that man. I bless him. Do not condemn him. I forgive him in your name. Unilaterally. The way Jesus did. And then you watch that shell begin to break. This is spiritual warfare. Paul says, we are fighting a war, but we're not fighting it with the weapons of carnality, not the weapons of this world. We're fighting it with spiritual weapons, and these weapons are mighty to bring down strongholds. The most powerful weapon that has been given into the hand of the Church of God is the power of forgiveness. That's the weapon that brings down strongholds. And we are given the privilege, you see, of beaming this out to people. And if we give the world, the tired and hurt and bleeding world, less than that, we're giving them less than the best that God has made available. I remember when we had a dear Negro lady, Olivia Henry, visiting in our home one day. She's an ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She has a little church in the inner city of Philadelphia. And at one point in her ministry there, she felt this leading of God, together with four other fellow ministers in that area, to have no part of any demonstrations, any maneuvers which would attempt to bring pressure upon the social and political institutions, but rather to simply live out their life of the gospel there in that situation. And you can imagine in the climate of today, that was not too well received, especially among some of her own people. But she said, as we began to experience some persecution because of our refusal to become identified with this or that cause or demonstration or march, uh, the Lord said, showed me something beautiful in the scripture. I was reading the scripture one day and it suddenly fell into place that my Lord Jesus was born in poverty and he lived in poverty and he died in poverty. And never once did he gather together a boatload of poverty-stricken Jews and take them to Rome to camp on Caesar's doorstep. That was right at the time of the Resurrection City incident in Washington. But you see, he gave them a power greater than the power of demonstration. He gave them the power of healing through the gospel. And out of that little center in Philadelphia has gone forth a tremendous power. You see, it is not that some of these things that one might otherwise do are bad. It's simply that they're not the best. And the enemy of the best is always something that's good. It isn't enough to do something good if God has given us something better. And in the power of forgiveness, God has given us the best. He's given us the power to beam out forgiveness. And you know, this is unlimited in its scope. This isn't just somebody that's hurt you. That man on the stretcher that came to Jesus, he hadn't offended Jesus. He just needed forgiveness. I love the story David Duplessy tells of sitting down between two uh, ladies on an airplane. And he uh, was very tired and he said, Lord, just let me sleep and have some rest and please keep me away from the smokers because I can't sleep with smoke blown in my face. So he was walking down the aisle and he saw a middle seat Uh, And there were two ladies, an elderly lady and a younger lady, and he thought that was a pretty good opportunity, pretty good chance there uh, to be set free from the uh, uh, secondhand smoke. And so he sat down and he said, no sooner did the warning light go off than their lights went on and they started to smoke. And he said, oh, Lord, why did you do this to me? And he said, the Lord spoke and said, forgive him, David. Forgive him? Yes, bless him. All right, he said, I I don't know why. I've never wanted to bless anybody smoking before, but I'll do it. He said, Lord, I forgive them. And if they get some enjoyment out of them, I'll bless them in it. Uh, And he said, I dropped off to sleep. He said, I had the most wonderful sleep, and they didn't smoke again the rest of the trip. Well, that's just almost a humorous illustration of what does indeed happen. And you'll find this happening in your life. You're going to see people change, and they won't know what hit them. They won't know that somebody has interceded before the throne of God to convey to them forgiveness. 
And you see, what does that do? That opens their heart. Then God can begin to deal with them. Karl Barth says, sin never really burns until it comes under the white hot light of forgiveness. So we thought we can't come to a person with forgiveness until they're all broken out in repentance. No, Jesus, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us and declared forgiveness to us. And in the wake of that, we enter into this forgiven life. This is the way Jesus forgave, unilaterally, because he saw in other people the need to be forgiven. And you know, this is a wonderful thing. In my own congregation, Ted will remember, we have a deep chancel. And I walk up to the chancel for parts of the service and then out to the congregation for other parts of the service. And as I come out to the congregation after the confessional service, or right after the opening hymn for the confessional service, I find it just wonderful thinking, Lord, I don't know what these people have been up to this week. I can't keep track of them all, and some of them may have fallen into sin. Uh, but Lord, right now I'm just a big parabolic reflector for you, and I'm beaming forgiveness out to this whole congregation right now that the power of it may be broken and that your forgiveness might enter in and deal with each life according to your abundant mercy. Wake up in the morning and you think of uh, things in your own family and before ever you speak a word of correction, before ever you try to lead and direct and guide your family, you beam out to them forgiveness. The children do something that irritates the life out of you. The first thing you do is, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I beam forgiveness to that child. Then can come well enough, a word of correction. But it comes now, you see, not in a judging spirit, not in a condemning spirit, but in a blessing and in a helping and correcting spirit. To build up and not to tear down. And so this morning as we conclude, I want you to put this to practice. I want to invite you to think of one person. If it can be a person in your own family, so much the better. In whom you see a need for forgiveness. Not because you're some great judge, but because God has given you the scripture and you know what's God's word and what's contrary to God's word. And you see this person, you know that there's an area of that life where they need to be forgiven. They need to be cleansed. They need to have a fresh beginning. And as I pray, I'm going to invite you to think and name that one person in your heart before God and beam out to that person the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, the cleansing of Calvary, and that person's life is going to be changed. Father in heaven, right now we come before your throne. We recall your precious promise that whosoever sins we forgive, they are forgiven. Give us the readiness, Lord, always to be stand under judgment by you whenever we have sinned and fallen short of our light. Lord, right now, we hold up before you this one person who may have rejected your word, who may have spoken thoughtlessly or cruelly, who may have sinned against you in one way or another. We hold this person up to you, Lord, and in love, we present them before you, and we bathe them in the light of forgiveness right now. We beam out to them the powerful forgiveness of Calvary. We see it penetrate into their innermost being. We see it break loose the shackles of sin. We see it destroy the deceptions of the devil. We see them set free. We see the chains begin to fall away. We see a new light come upon their face as the forgiving and reconciling work of Calvary breaks in upon them at the level of their spirit and begins to work up into their thoughts, into their actions, into their whole fabric of life. And we believe, Lord, that in this very moment that we have done a transaction which shall last for all eternity because your word will not return void. Amen.